Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I trust that you've had your coffee and your Wheaties, and you're ready to have some conversation. Uh, my name is Eric Williams, and I am the curator of religion at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. And we are delighted to be here today uh, for the annual meeting of the American Academy of Religion um, to curate a wonderful conversation on policy and poetry. Uh, we are joined today by an illustrious panel, and I'm going to introduce them just now. And then we will have, um, after each panelist has presented, we will have a time of conversation uh, between the panelists, and then we'll open up for some conversation with the audience. Does that sound all right? OK. Our first uh, uh, panelist is uh, the Reverend Dr. Brad Braxton who is the director of the Center for the Study of African American Religious Life and the supervisory curator of religion at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. He holds a PhD in New Testament studies from Emory University, where he was a George Woodruff Fellow, a master's degree in theology from the University of Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar, and a bachelor's degree in religious studies from the University of Virginia, where he was a Jefferson Scholar, a member of Phi Beta Kappa. He is the author of three scholarly books and numerous essays exploring the intersection of religion and social justice. Uh, Dr. Braxton is a seasoned educator who has held lec lectureships at Georgetown University, Harvard uh, Divinity School, McCormick Theological Seminary, and professorships at Southern Methodist University, Vanderbilt University, and Wake Forest University. Dr. Braxton is also the founder of the Open Church of Maryland, a progressive, uh, as he calls it, funky av avant-garde church in the city of Baltimore. We also have with us today uh, the Reverend Dr. Jennifer Leaf, who joined the Isle of Faculty in 2015 as the Assistant Professor of Religion and Social Justice. Professor Leaf's research concentrates on the intersection of sexualities and religions and sacred communities and spaces of African diaspora. Her scholarship also engages the intersection of Afro-diasporic women's spiritualities and social activism. Um, Dr. Leaf is also an itinerant elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, where she has served as pastor in White Plains, New York, and in Media, Pennsylvania, where she served as associate pastor uh, at churches in Philadelphia, New York, and New England. Uh, she currently serves as the pastor of the Campbell Chapel AME Church here in Denver. And because of a standing, in, uh, standing in appointment that she has, uh, she will have to leave a little early. But we're grateful for uh, having her here with us today. Our next uh, uh, panelist, uh, Mr. Kareem Jackson, who's better known by his stage name, Tef Poe, short for Teflon Poetics. <laughs> he is an American rapper, musician, and activist from St. Louis, Missouri. Tef is one of the co-founders of the Hands Up United Movement. He has consistently advocated grassroots involvement in improving the lives of African Americans and in racial justice within and outside of the United States. In his art and activism, he insists on the value of local people taking charge of conversations about their own communities rather than relying on national organizations. We also have with us today Professor Vincent Stringer, who has been critically acclaimed by the Boston Globe as a first-class bass baritone for his performances of German Leader. He has appeared in opera oratorio and recital throughout the United States, Europe, China, Africa, and the Middle East. He has been a featured artist in performances at the Kennedy Center, uh, Lincoln Center, in Edinburgh, Marlboro uh, music festivals, Among others, he is an advocate for new forms of music. Uh, Professor Sp Stringer holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in voice from Eastern Nazarene College, Master's of Music degree in opera performance. Uh, he also has an additional, an additional diploma in voice from the New England Conservatory of Music. And he, took, uh, he also studied German language at the Institute in Berlin, uh, Germany. Stringer is a founder and former artistic director of the critically acclaimed New England and National Spiritual Ensembles, 
and is the founder of the Baltimore Summer Opera Workshop at Morgan State University, where he taught in the Department of Fine and Performing Arts. His CD recordings include the Langston Hughes gospel song play, Black Nativity, recorded by Milestones and Marvels uh, Records, and a CD for Revels Records of Negro spirituals arranged by John Andrew Ross. Uh, Professor Stringer also serves as um, on the worship and arts team of the Open Church of Maryland. Our final panelist, Alanda Clay, is an academic librarian, scholar of religion, and a, a techie and poet. She is a PhD candidate at the Free University of Amsterdam in theology and religious studies. Through an early love for reading, telling stories, and writing, Clay discovered poetry to be a space where she could laugh, cry, heal, and talk back. As a writer, she resuscitates the alchemy of creative verbal transmutation. That is, she practices and performs the creative power words whole for cultivating personal and social change in the now. So we are very fortunate to have all of them with us today. And we're going to begin with uh, some framing comments by Dr. Braxton. Good morning. Permit me to present some framing comments for our panel from this title, Policy and Poetry, Progressive African American Religion in Times Like These. When AAR approached Eric Williams and me about leading a session exploring the public understanding of religion and the arts, we gladly accepted. The public promotion of religious literacy is a central tenet of our mission at the Smithsonian Center for the Study of African American Religious Life. Eric and I did not labor long concerning the specific topic for the panel the aha moment of awareness quickly seized us. I shared with Eric that this panel might be an opportune time to return to some theorizing I had done during my service as the program officer for religion in the public sphere at the Ford Foundation, a philanthropic institution whose annual grant-making activities typically exceed $500 million. Briefly, come with me back in time to my first meeting as a grant maker at the Ford Foundation. One morning in 2014, dozens of senior leaders at Ford, including vice presidents and program officers, gathered in a conference room in Ford's historic building in Midtown East, Manhattan. One of the vice presidents graciously introduced me to the group since it was my first meeting. As the new kid on the team, I thought it best to listen to the discussion as the group talked about theories of social change and philanthropy's role as a partner in that process. Around the table were brilliant scholars, policy and educational analysts and attorneys, and the atmosphere was replete with cogent examinations of various dimensions of public policy. As a scholar deeply committed to progressive social transformation, I was honored to be in that room and delighted to watch my new colleagues work from the depths of their respective disciplines. Yet, the longer I listened, the more uncomfortable I became. I began having auditory hallucinations. In my third ear, I started hearing 
the driving polyphonic rhythms of the African drum. I was in a well-appointed corporate boardroom. There was no way I was hearing the drum. But you know, the drum, that African drum that talks, would not leave me alone. It was as if the drum was saying, Brad, you are a scholar of religion, and you come from people who were the original architects of religion, art, culture, and commerce. The policy conversation your colleagues are having around this table is not incorrect. However, the conversation is incomplete. While this is your first meeting at Ford, this is no time for feigned humility or timidity. Raise your hand, Brad, and speak your truth. Before I knew it, I raised my hand, and the Ford Foundation vice president moderating the meeting called on me, and before I knew it, I said, I appreciate this keen policy analysis, but where is the poetry? Where is the music? Is there anything that hums in what has been said? I continued saying, there is a West African proverb that insists, where there is no music, the spirit will not come. If we are going to change the world, there has got to be some music, some poetry. In professional philanthropy, grant makers often discuss their theory of social change. Well, in my first meeting at the Ford Foundation several years ago, I gave my theory of social change in a sentence. Where there is no music, the spirit will not come. In an attempt to build out my theory of social change in ways that could support tangible grant making, I eventually wrote a substantive concept paper for Ford about the role of policy and poetry in religiously motivated social transformation. That concept paper has provided in some significant ways the intellectual scaffolding for our conversation today. It should also be noted that when potential grantees would visit me at the Ford Foundation to present ideas for their grant proposals, my initial questions to them were often, what hums in your grant proposal? Is there any music? Here, as we set the stage for this conversation about the artistic imagination, I want to define and argue for progressive approaches to African American religion in this cultural moment that is both perilous and filled with positive possibilities. In my estimation, progressive African-American religion realizes that sacred text and authoritative traditions must be critically engaged and continually reinterpreted in light of contemporary circumstances to prevent religion from becoming a relic. Flexibility and a high tolerance for pluralism and nuance, rather than unyielding adherence to narrowly defined dogmas should characterize the progressive African-American religious ethos. Thus, let me be abundantly clear. As we discuss poetry today and the African-American religious imagination, I do not romanticize African-American religion. There are some deeply problematic manifestations 
of African-American religion that must be subjected to rigorous critique. For example, after nearly 20 years of serving as a theological educator, I am dismayed by how many African-American religious traditions, and especially those with a Christian orientation, remain enslaved to antiquated scriptural hermeneutics and colonial theologies. These hegemonic hermeneutics and theologies oppress women, girls, LGBTQ persons, persons who are economically vulnerable and differently abled, and persons who hold different or no religious affiliation, to name a few. Several years ago, under the prophetic prompting of David Daniels at McCormick Theological Seminary, I made an important shift in my work as a scholar, religious leader, and artistically inspired social change agent. I decided to stop obsessing about what was wrong with African American religion. Instead, attempting to channel the creativity and courage of artists and activists past and present, I rededicated my life to building theoretical and pragmatic alternatives that provide, in the words of that field preacher from Galilee, life and life more abundantly. Consequently, in addition to my full-time work at the Smithsonian Institution and in other academic institutions, I have spent the last seven years establishing the Open Church of Maryland, a radically inclusive and predominantly African-American religious community in Baltimore. This community is committed to courageous social justice activism and compassionate interfaith collaboration. When I talk about poetry in progressive African-American religion, I am not pontificating. I am practically tangibilitating a religious community that is basically 50% heterosexual and 50% LGBTQ, a congregation that from its inception has regularly officiated LGBTQ weddings and engaged in meaningful collaboration with sacred siblings from Baha'i, Buddhist, Jewish, Muslim, and religiously unaffiliated communities. A congregation where the power of the pulpit is generously shared. As many congregants as were interested received a seminary level introduction to preaching course that I taught. And those congregants are as likely to proclaim the good news on a Sunday morning as I and the other two seminary trained pastors are. Additionally, our pulpit recently at the Open Church has hosted an African-American heterosexual Muslim rap artist, a white lesbian Zen Buddhist priest, and an African-American transgender Catholic priest, and the congregation received them all gladly. This inchoate and still precarious experiment of radical religious openness, which is deeply indebted to the ancestors Howard Thurman and Zora Neale Hurston and the village elder Cecil Williams, has been aided by the purposeful embrace of creativity and the artistic imagination. It was the artistic imagination in a seminal sermon that I preached in the congregation's infancy that enabled us to replace rigid fundamentalist notions of biblical authority with more spirit-infused, African-derived approaches to religious authority that value spirit and our embodied experiences and rituals as sacred texts that are as holy as scripture. Furthermore, in the main hallway of the Open Church's facility, we literally have a rotating art gallery 
curated by Professor Vincent Stringer, from whom we will hear shortly. The gallery showcases beautiful and provocative renderings from Baltimore artists, and some of the artists occasionally visit us to discuss their attempts to channel a sacred creativity that can change the world. The African-American religious imagination is sorely needed in this moment to challenge and change external systems of domination. And that same imagination is needed to exhort some African-American religious communities to confess and repent of their complicity in the very systems of domination they seemingly protest. Furthermore, these African-American religious communities can signal the authenticity of their confessions and repentance by creating inclusive and equitable communities where believers embody the Lord's Prayer as much as they pray it. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Speaking of heaven, I will conclude my reflections with brief musings on the connection among the artistic imagination, pedagogy, and cosmology. For those of us who are classroom teachers, we regularly interact with millennials, and very soon, Generation Z will flood our college classrooms. These emerging social media savvy leaders are zealously seeking more meaningful connections between higher education and social transformation. I argue that the artistic imagination can provide access to much needed and often neglected pedagogical power. And that resource is cosmological power. The African-American religious imagination has taught me that there are dimensions of spirit and power available to us beyond what our finite senses can detect at any moment. According to African-American religion, the visible and invisible dimensions of existence are connected by spirit. The eternal life force animating the cosmos with divine purpose. When honorable members of an African tribe die, they continue to live as spirits. These ancestral spirits provide moral guidance to those who are still physically alive. African-derived ways of knowing acknowledge and humbly access the wisdom and power of the ancestors. My openness to music and poetry in the classroom has enabled me to summon cosmological power through the ancestors. And that power has seemingly taken my teaching at times to seventh heaven. My poetry enabled cosmological pedagogy was effectively road tested recently at Harvard Divinity School. In the spring semester of 2016, Dr. Eric Williams and I taught a Harvard Divinity School course titled Preaching, Healing, and Justice. In the course, students witnessed firsthand the social significance of performing religious practices with intellectual sophistication and artistic finesse. In the final assignment of the course, students were asked to preach a eulogy and create a funeral liturgy for one of the recent victims of police-related lethal force, Rakia Boyd, Michael Brown, 
Tanisha Anderson, Eric Garner, or Freddie Gray. Many students in the course acknowledged how the relevance and specificity of the final assignment plumbed the depths of their emotive intelligence and aesthetic imagination as much as it probed their cognitive intelligence. Because of the course's unrelenting commitment to the artistic imagination, the course even attracted an MIT graduate student in architecture and urban planning who audited the course. This student began thinking more deeply about the creation of equitable public spaces in the urban landscape as a form of proclamation, or I might say, poetry. While Dr. Williams and I had carefully prepared the syllabus, I'm convinced, persuaded, that the success of the course was ultimately the result of spirit and cosmological power unleashed through poetry. I've got to tell y'all what happened on the first day of class. The first day of class, I was honored to be a lecturer at Harvard. It was an exciting opportunity. And so proud was my wife, Lizetta, that she flew with me to Boston to sit in that first class in Harvard Divinity School. And yet, the drum kept beating. And this classroom was like any other classroom I had inherited across my many years of teaching. And so on that first day of class, even at Harvard, I did what I always do. I said, there is a West African proverb that where there is no music, the spirit will not come. And I launched out, I woke up this morning with my mind, stayed on freedom. And Dr. Williams, who also has an orchestra in his throat, joined with me. And we began to saturate the atmosphere at Harvard Divinity School with sound theology. And as that sound theology began creating acoustical hospitality, something happened. I told you that my wife, Lizetta, joined me. My wife is a serious professional businesswoman with a degree from the University of Virginia and an MBA from Wake Forest University and a leader in the financial planning industry in this country, a serious professional woman who also flows very nimbly in manifestations of African traditional religion. And since she and I visited Benin and Ghana, she has regularly been a medium, what some of the sisters might call, she is a host for visitations of the spirit. And the moment that sound theology began at Harvard, I saw it happen. The students didn't know what happened, but I saw it. The moment that the poetry was unleashed, my wife started. The tears were coming. She began rocking back and forth. And I knew that at that moment, the ancestors had walked into the room. She later told me that she had a visitation at Harvard of Yah Asantawa, the Ashanti female warrior who fought back the British. Now, I know this may make you uncomfortable, but at Harvard, those of us who function in the artistic are comfortable saying that that day and every subsequent day, the ancestors walked in and said, we're so glad you made room for us. We concluded the semester after lots of singing and crying and arguing and doing all the things that you would imagine, but talking about the body and kinesthetics and aesthetics and poetry in a group of religious leaders, many of whom will never go serve religious congregations, but who were opened, perhaps for the first time in their lives, to the artistic dimensions of social change. We concluded the semester at Harvard with an anointing service. I told a colleague of mine who was an alumnus that we did an anointing. And before I could get the word anointing, he said, you did a what at Harvard Divinity School? And not one of those social change agents, most of whom were millennials, in any way rejected on that last day when we put oil on their foreheads and encouraged them in whatever spirit you go forth to go forth and shake up the world for the sake of righteousness. 
I guess I'm trying to tell you, you have not taught until you have taught when the ancestors show up. I'd like you to join me. Just close your eyes and experience the vibration of sound as I invoke the ancestors. Guide me, O oh Thou, great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but that mighty hold me with thy thy powerful hand bread of heaven bread of heaven feed me till I I want no more. Open now the crystal fountain whence the healing stream doth flow. Let the fire and cloudy pillar be thou still my strength and shield strong deliverer strong deliverer <coughs> be thou still my strength and shield dedicate this moment to Sun Ra. Hmm. With gratitude for the doors he opens to liberated poetics that carry us to Afro futures beyond this world. Blood and love. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love each other and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Asada, she who struggles. Olugbala, love for the people. 
Shakur, the thankful, penned these words in her autobiography. Having articulated this raison d'etre, rising from the ashes of the civil rights and black power movements, yes, this exile, this woman now even in political asylum in Cuba following her escape from prison in 1979, having been unjustly arrested and convicted, Asada Shakur, yes, she inspires a becoming generation of black and brown people fighting for freedom. Asada's words and work remind us that even if and when we must take refuge, there is no asylum from the struggle for justice. Struggles for justice are the plumb lines that measure authentic living. Her words were among those preached and heard and chanted in the nascent stages of what was birthed as the Black Lives Matter movement and the movement and movements for black lives that have sprouted since the murder of Michael Brown. And of course, we know that it is not just his murder that activates us, but a continuous stream of lynchings since black people were identified as work machine bodies and stolen from the soil of a continent, some called Africa, up to today, even as we continue to track the suspicious and untimely deaths of black and brown activists who have been on the ground sacrificing time, talent, sanity and life for our liberation and our freedom. Our duty to fight for our freedom, our duty to win, is the demand of blood-soaked soil. This soil cried out to Asada Alugbala Shakur when she wrote of Rima Alugbala, a member of the Black Liberation Army who was framed and arrested along with Asada and Ronald Myers. Rima died while trying to escape from the Brooklyn House of Detention, another black man who died trying to be free. Asada wrote, for Rima Alugbala, young blood, they think they killed you, but I saw you yesterday, standing with your hands in your pockets, waiting for the real deal to go down. I saw you smiling, your fuck it smile, blood in your eyes, your, your pumping freedom, young blood. They think they killed you, but I saw you yesterday, in the playground, black skin, sweaty, shiny, hurling your ball bomb into the hoop, right on target. Won't be no game next time, cause you ain't hardly playing. They think they killed you, but I saw you yesterday with your back against the wall, muscles bulging against the chains, eyes absorbing truth, lips speaking it, heart learning how to love, head learning how to hate, bloody blood ready to flow toward freedom, young blood. Young bloods ain't got no blood to waste in no syringes, on no bathroom floors, in no strange lands, delaying other young blood's freedom. We don't need no tired blood, no anemic blood, no blood clots in our new body. They think they killed you, but I saw you yesterday. All them young bloods must have given, must, must have gave you a transfusion. All that strong blood, all that rich blood, all that angry blood flowing through your veins toward tomorrow. The constant of black and brown people suffering and dying at disproportionate rates and dying in the most unnatural ways, our bodies, our lives, and our realities always mediating, mitigating, navigating, and negotiating racism has a way of drawing out and driving a macabre poetry. While the dismantling of systemic racism often demands that votes be cast and counted, that lawyers be called and legal documents be reviewed, that policies read, rejected, revised, and reconsidered be lifted up, it is the muted songs of the souls of black folks that seep out in our joy, in our suffering, in our joy despite suffering, in our suffering despite joy. It is the poetry of life through which we can see our way clear to the policies and proposals that nurture us to love each other and support each other, having nothing to lose but our chains. We who struggle recognize that ours is not a fight that can be fought without soul. Ours is not a fight that can be fought without love. And when the soul that fights is filled with love, its poetic power opens prophetic possibilities everywhere. 
Love cannot be contained. Love changes policies. Love over overwhelms policies. Love extends beyond policies. Love is going high when others go low. Actually, love is the only viable option. Love cannot be contained. Soul cannot be killed. The soul filled with love is unconquerable. And so we must allow the spirit to lead where love leads. In the face of the modern day lynchings of black people, my learning and teaching pa patterns have changed. This is the demand that the blood soaked soil makes of me. From a reading group at Harvard Divinity School to a Black Lives Matter course with Darnell Moore, from a Black Lives Matter course with Darnell Moore to a bicentennial contemplation of the social justice legacies of the AME Church, from a contemplation of the justice legacy of the church to a revamping of a Black Lives Matter course with our beloved Ferguson activist, Hands Up United founder and rapper recording artist Taft Poe, from this revamped course to the pulpit of Campbell Chapel AME Church where Poe declared that Tupac Shakur was among the most significant of our modern day prophets, from the pulpit to discursive fellowship with Taft Poe and Bridie Harris. And from this discursive fellowship to a new course on God and Tupac, without the queer response of fighting Souls filled with love, despair is the only rational response to blood-soaked soil. Without the queer response of fighting souls filled with love, the self-fulfilling prophecy of every social policy, procedure, and proposal would be the demise of black and brown folks. But fighting souls filled with love demand something different. And though we may not fit in any categories or boxes well, our demands are clear. Our freedom must be won. Our chains must be lost. Our love and support for one another must be unwavering. And of these demands, love is the author, driver, and quintessential telos. The demand of fighting bloody soil Souls filled with love is material change. The son of Afeni Shakur, the godson of Asada Shakur Tupac, was a child of Black Panthers. He was a child who took up the mantle to fight for justice. The one to whom it was revealed that the hate you give little infants fucks everyone. Was far from perfect, but he understood that hate was not fertile soil. A lyrical genius, Tupac disrupted theological conclusions about heaven and the ghetto, as well as saints and gangsters. Tupac also recognized that you need companions, partners, learner, learners, and teachers to accompany on the path toward freedom. However, it is no secret, again, that Tupac was far from perfect. But there are no perfect prophets. There are no uncomplicated prophets on capitalism, and on matters of gender sexuality, we're left with a complicated and at times unflattering icon. Yet for my colleague Tef Poe, there's not only something about Tupac that must be appreciated and respected, there's something about Tupac for Tef that inspires. And the inspiration happens at the crossroad of faith, activism, and the performing arts. This space of inspiration is where the fighting soul, filled with love, insists on living and refusing to die. Tef, thank you for being here today, for your place in the fight for freedom, and for helping us to see our North Star together at the crossroads of faith, activism, and performance. Thank you for helping us to see and never forget that it is for us to follow the spirit that leads to liberation. So to conclude, I return to Asada, Tupac's godmother, the godmother of our contemporary movement, one who knows, who shows us how even now, living in our spirits, how poetics can shape our policy as we continue to fight for our freedom, loving and supporting one another. There are more battles to fight 
There are more prophecies to be spoken. There are more prophets to be protected and harbored. More lives will be lost. More poems, songs, books, and papers must be written. More protests must be planned and executed. More blood will be shed. We do not celebrate any bloodshed. Still, remembering that even when we die, we are not dead, and that when we face death, we still have breath, Asada Alugbala Shakur encourages us. Love is contraband in hell. Because love is an acid that eats away bars. But you, me, and tomorrow hold hands and make vows that struggle will multiply. The hacksaw has two blades. The shotgun has two barrels. We are pregnant with freedom. We are a conspiracy. I see it clearly. We reinvented the glass window, powered up like a battery. We are about as different as the alien's anatomy, the abnormal genius, my people are the Gatling. I'm throwing gang signs at Hitler, I'm time traveling. My mindless behavior is more talented than Justin Bieber. My confines come by in Christ and Allah for the non-believers. Infinity's final jokes, this is where it starts. I tell them we created more hurricanes than harp. Conspiracy theorists using my lyrics to get them through. If you don't believe in me, the conspiracy is you. Nanomorphin my endorsements of the THC. I'm hard to find like a video on MTV. I'm praying for Asada. F the penitentiary. Optimus Prime lasers till I conquer the century. 106 in Park, I was undefeated on BET. Black God like Master Farad on the TV. My cousin is in the grave, but the message in the seed. He said, Kareem, this ain't a dream. I'm right here if you need me. I'm better than the industry, but the industry really don't care. So F the industry, affinity is what I'm living for. Go to church with my parents. Repent it for my sins. They told us that Jesus was white, so the story begins. Why did they lie to my people, give us hope through religion? Obama was in the Oval Office, but he ain't treat us different. America is so ugly. She don't love us at all. People dying in Ferguson, she won't get involved. People dying in Palestine, she won't get involved. People dying in Chicago, she won't get involved. I'm speaking the truth. I will not try to dumb it down. Put my hands in shackles and leave my blood on the ground. Christopher Columbus, George Washington, Adolf Hitler, I might not be dead to touch you, but the universe gonna get you. Donald Trump is a coward, and I mean it sincerely. Send your troopers to kill me. Let's go to war if you hear me. Ain't no love for my people, so ain't no hope for this system. When they do build a school, they use it to deceive us. I want to give a shout out to uh, our co-instructor, Bridie. Uh, who, it was actually her idea that uh, sparked the birth of the Tupac course that me, her, and Jennifer Lee teach at Um I'm going to try to be brief, because I can be a bit long with it. Um, we live in a, peril, a, a time that is completely complicated. Uh, everybody's looking for the birth and the dawn of the next Malcolm and the next Martin Luther King and the next Asada Shakur, but at the same time, don't nobody want to go to jail. Don't nobody want to get assassinated. So we have people who present these drastic radical dilemmas, but we don't want to radically approach the radical dilemma. We uh, talk about this, this mythological impeding race war that, oh, Donald Trump trying to start a race war, really, because in a war there's casualties on both sides. So war means when you go get your guns, we're going to go get our guns. And in theory, I hate, that, I hate the, the, the wording of that because black people in this country have never preemptively sparked any form of a racial conflict. So, uh, 
the notion that we're going to finally in 2019, 2020 decide, this is it, y'all. We're going to go get our guns and participate in this uh, Lord of the Rings, Chronicle of Narnia race war that is supposedly being cooked up. That's just, that's just a lie. Like, they got more guns than, than Baghdad in the ghetto, and they're not tripping off bringing those guns to combat white supremacists whatsoever. So even that narrative of framing the, 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 the victim in that situation or the recipient of the violence from one party to the next, uh, we still don't frame that correctly because the race war, we aren't declaring war on nobody. The war has been declared on us. We're still peacefully trying to negotiate that. Um, and this is complicated because in this country, we talk about the rule of law a lot, but there are virtually no laws that holistically apply to white citizens. Yeah, you can go to jail for murder, get a speeding ticket, but I mean, holistic, the, 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 the weight, the full gravity of the law if you and I commit the same exact crime. Um, I'm gonna reap the wrath of that more so than you. So in 1964, there were 22 million black people in this country. Uh, in 2010, the census says there are about 42 million. So if we do the math, you'll see that this number has um, doubled, but our political power has drastically dis diminished. And I'm into political science. I'm a three-time Harvard fellow. I don't have a high school diploma. All of this magical stuff they tell y'all about how to succeed in, in life means nothing. So um, when I teach at Harvard, I, tell these, I talk about this stuff very candidly. Uh, our political power has diminished. And when you look at the, the scenario from a more up-close lens, you ask yourself, what happened? Where is it at? And we forgot about our points of equity as a collective. Uh, we birth culture. We birth essentially every major revolution that this country has seen on this soil we've been a part of. I'm talking all the way back to the Revolutionary War when the French brought boatloads of Haitians here to help these settlers that couldn't even plant a corn seed fight the most powerful empire in the world. So. Um, we've participated in the process step by step, day by day, inch by inch. Yet the retain, we haven't retained the power. We haven't retained the benefit from our blood, sweat, and tears. And that's partially because, like I just said, we forgot about our points of equity. We birth revolution. When something ain't right, we're the most marginalized. We're going to speak up. If I see somebody mistreating a woman, and, and, and I'm like, no, that's not cool. If I see somebody mistreating one of my queer friends, no, that's not cool. We speak up. We put our necks on the line. Um, but our points of equity are culture, creativity, and the, the notion that we understand what struggle is. We understand that uh, right and wrong does not have a gray area. And we have moved ourselves into this apathetic place of uh, forgiveness, forgiveness uh, for the wrongdoings that have been not only committed against us, but people of color globally. And the global diaspora is really important in this conversation because uh, we have a generation that loves the quote Asada. We love, I, I, I can't do the Asada chant with y'all no more because ain't nobody going to do nothing if the police storm in here and actually arrest me after we do the Asada chant. So I refuse to participate in that chant with people that are just going to throw her words at the wall like she isn't actually living in exile. So I'm talking about revolutionaries more so than activists. Um, it's my personal goal that by the time I leave this planet to be identified as a person that's participating in the heritage of black radical revolutionaries. Uh, I believe Jesus Christ was a revolutionary. Uh, I believe Tupac Shakur is a revolutionary. I believe Lauren Hill is a revolutionary. There's so many different modules of what an actual revolutionary looks like. Um, and all too often, we get stuck in this framework that, may, that means that we have to adhere to it, looking like this, flowing like this, sounding like this, feeling like this. 
And, and I just don't believe in any of that. So um, you look at the situation, even after we've had our ancestors' wildest imagination, a, a, a black man in the Oval Office with an Arabic name, a president whose middle name was Hussein. And you say, what happened? Four years of that, and then what happened? Like, what, where, where is it gone? Um, I would render that a lot of our understanding of empire and the application of empire and the faces of empire and the different type of people that run empire, uh, we've separated ourselves from that heritage while steadily uplifting our ancestors as, as modules of resistance. And I don't think that my ancestors would approve of uh, senseless drone killings and invasions of uh, African countries and uh, mass incarceration um, despite whoever is in the Oval Office. So uh, that's just not an agenda that I believe black radicalism participated in. Uh, so the art is important because the politics becomes so caveated that there, there's often no real solutions in the politics. Uh, the art is what births revolutionary mind frame. When those kids that were outside of Ferguson and they said, you know, they came, they showed up with the loudspeaker and they were playing Lil Boosie. And the song they were playing from Lil Boosie was F the Police. And when they played it and, 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 and that, that feeling and that emotion, that created a political response from a cultural point of reference. Like a, something culturally sparked a revolution in that moment. And if there was no music there, then we probably wouldn't have had an uprising. And day after day, different kids would come out, make chants, and we would almost have battles with who had the best chance. And one thing happens, and another thing happens, and another thing happens. And we, we go through the winter, and then we find ourselves lapping the Mon Mon Montgomery bus boycott. But the narrative that gets framed around it is, oh, they lack sophistication because you saw a couple of us out there with our shirts off, pants sagging, and a couple face tattoos. I'm from the ghetto, and I went to the United Nations to testify against this country, against uh, the terrorisms of police brutality. I got back off the plane from the United Nations and slept in the ghetto that night. To me, that's sophisticated. So, um, I try to just uplift the fact that uh, we need the artists, but we need the artists to be greater than just artists, because art, for the sake of art, you can keep it. You can, you, can, you can wipe your butt with that and flush it down the toilet. We got enough art for the sake of art. Uh, if the art isn't gonna lock arms with me when I'm being shot at by the police, if the art doesn't view that, that we are in a, the same type of dilemma, that, that, that this is life or death, then I don't need your art. And uh, I think that creates a pathway for us all to see what our role should be at this, in this moment. I look back at uh, when Russia was fighting Germany. And you got two cruel dictators against each other. You got Stalin versus Hitler. Hitler had Stalin cornered. They couldn't really mess with the, the German army. America really didn't want to get in the war despite what history tells you. They were like, hey, it's the Germans versus the Russians. Who cares if they kill each other off? So the Russians are getting slaughtered by the Germans, and Stalin says, hey, if you retreat, we're going to kill you. He was talking to the citizens of the land. Now, that's drastic. That's over the top. That's partially insane. Like, why is he killing his own citizens? But there's a, a caveated logic in that where we're trying to save the preservation of our lives. We are being slaughtered by this engrossing regime. I need every citizen possible to bear arms against this engrossing regime and figure out what they're gonna do as we combat what could potentially be the demise of our society, our religion, our, our culture, and our possibility to create offspring. So uh, history, I'm gonna wrap it up, I got five minutes. But history teaches us uh, so many lessons that we should study and the art is just important in, in, in attaching us to those lessons. Peace. Good morning again. I'd like you to join me in this next few minutes in an experience that I'm going to lead you through in song and poetry. 
The first poem I'm going to share with you is from James Weldon Johnson, a poem where he celebrates and recognizes the great contribution of those unnamed, unknown artists who created the songs we know as the spirituals. O oh, black and unknown bards. O oh, black and unknown bards of long ago, how came your lips to touch the sacred fire? How in your darkness did you come to know the power and the beauty of the minstrel's lyre? Who first from midst his bonds lifted his eyes? Who first from out the lone watch, still and long, feeling the ancient faith of prophets rise within his dark-kept soul? burst into song. Steal away, steal away, steal away to Jesus. Steal away, steal away. Heart of what slave poured out such melody as steal away to Jesus? On its strains, his spirit must have nightly floated free, though still about his hands he felt his chains. Who heard great Jordan roll? Whose starward eyes saw chariots swing low? And who was he that breathed that comforting, melodic sigh? Nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows the trouble I see, Lord. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows the trouble I see, Lord. Nobody knows but Jesus. What merely living clod, what captive thing, could up towards God through all its darkness grope and find within its deadened heart to sing these songs of sorrow, love, and faith, and hope. How did it catch that subtle undertone, that note in music not heard with the ears? How sound the elusive reed so seldom blown, which stirs the soul and melts the heart to tears? Not that great German master in his dream of harmonies that thundered amongst the stars at creation ever heard a theme nobler than go down Moses. Mark its bars, how like a mighty trumpet call they stir the blood. Such are the notes that men have sung going to valorous deeds. Such tones there were that helped make history when time was young. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt land, tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt land, tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. There is a wide, wide wonder in it all. 
that from degraded rest and servile toil, the fiery spirit of the seer should call these simple children of the sun and soil. O oh, black slave singers, gone, forgot, unknown, you, you a long, long line of those who've sung untaught, unknown, unnamed, have stretched out upward seeking the divine. You sang not deeds of heroes or of kings, no chant of bloody war, no exalting peon of arms won triumph, but your humble strings you touched in chord with music empyrean. You sang far better than you knew the songs that for your hungry listeners heart sufficed, still live. But more than this, to you belongs, you sang a race from wood and stone to Christ. Little boy, how old are you? Little boy, how old are you? Little boy, how old are you? Sir, I'm only 12 years old. This little boy had them to remember that he was born the 25th of December. Lawyers and doctors were amazed and had to give the little boy the praise. Little boy, how old are you? Little boy, how old are you? Little boy, how old are you? Sir, I'm only 12 years old. Lawyers and doctors stood and wondered as though they had been struck by thunder. Then they decided a while they wondered that all mankind must come under. Little boy, how old are you? Little boy, how old are you? Little boy, how old are you, sir? I'm only 12 years old. The last time the little boy was seen, he was standing on Mount Olivet Green. When he dispersed of the crowd, he entered up into a cloud. Little boy, how old are you? Little boy, how old are you? Little boy, how old are you? Sir, I'm only 12 years old. Mother's lament, so many names unknown, so many sons lost. I couldn't sleep last night, my mind preoccupied with worry. I couldn't reason why, but it kept me awake all night. I paced and paced the floor, I prayed and prayed for peace. I asked the Lord to calm my thoughts and help me get some needed sleep, but still my mind would not let go. No word from God, no sleep, no, no. Just worry, worry through the night and hope for peace in the morning light. I worry for his life, my son, each time he leaves the house, a black man-child isn't safe out there in this angry world filled with hate and fear. There's so much danger on the city streets with random violence far and near. My son, 
His life could be cut short if accused of crimes. This is my fear. He could be crucified at 12 years old on a playground with his toy gun. Like Tamir Rice, in two seconds flat, shot down by a Cleveland cop. He could be kidnapped at 14 and crucified in woods by a southern stream like Emmett Till, whose hopes were killed. His dreams of summer float cold and still. So many names unknown, so many lost sons, so many broken hearts, so many lights dimmed. He could be dragged behind a truck, dismembered limb from limb, like James Byrd Jr., crucified by angry, hateful, racist men. He could be murdered at 17 while walking home one night like Trayvon Martin while on his street, confronted by a would-be cop. He could be crucified in broad daylight, like Michael Brown, shot down unarmed, assailed by a Ferguson police that feared his brown skin and his might. So many names are known. So many lost sons, so many hearts broken, so many lights dimmed. He could be crucified at 27 by a policeman on an L.A. street who'd find his artistic movements threatening, like the ones of Stephen Eugene Washington. He could be killed at 28, shot down right near a garden gate like D. Roderick Cook, who never rose on that Easter Sunday morn. So many names unknown, so many lost sons, so many broken hearts, so many lights dimmed. The threat is very real out there, but who's the bigger threat? My son, our community, the police, where exactly does the danger lay? My son could leave and not return, except in a coffin, in chains, or an urn. Could I lose my child, my flesh, my blood? His life be cut down by hatred? Dear Lord, protect my son today. Keep him in your care, I pray. Teach him wisdom to respond and not react with anger. Show him, Lord, the way back home to the love in his mother's heart. Preserve him for a long life filled with mercy, justice, and courage. Ye sons of Jacob, born of Leah, Rachel, Bilhah, and Zilpah, let your light shine bright and strong as a beacon through this darkened age. So many names unknown, so many sons lost, so many hearts broken, so many lights dimmed. And for those parents who've lost a child, give them peace within their hearts. Heal their wounds and soothe their pain. Guide them with your perfect light. Amen. Ignorance delight, just have some. Ignorance delight, headlines. Headlines, that's what we see. Sensationalized stories, not nearly complete. Stories diluted by corporate elite, powerful players who control by deceit. They'll keep us distracted with conflicts and lies and stories of wars that may threaten our lives. So some can do business and keep us knee deep in credit card debt and medical receipts. 
a system of commerce which is fueled by oil is part of the plot which still keeps us in toil. The toil that bathes us in ignorant bliss and launders the wealthy all starchy and crisp. Are we unaware of the state that we're in? Because we rely on the anchorman's grin. While sopping up stories, he serves us each night with biscuits and gravy and ignorant delight. Thank you. Those are just, through my life, poetry has always meant a tremendous amount to me. It's been a means of expression. Creativity has been a part of what has made me who I am today. As a child, I would, in, in elementary school, my mother would say, the teachers would write on my report card, give him a pencil or crayons and some paper and sit him in a corner and he'll be quiet all day, but he'll create something. From a child, I was always engaged in the inner world. I came from a large family. I'm the youngest of my, of my mother's nine children. I'm the youngest boy but I am the 22nd child of my father's 23 children. And so creativity and alone time was an important thing for me. I could live in my yard under the trees, in the dirt, with my cars and play my games with my cars, making cities, creating stories, creating all kinds of things. That stuff continued with me. My parents wanted me to be a musician and be a church musician. They put me in piano lessons like they did my brothers. I didn't want to play for the church. I did, but I didn't want to. What I wanted to do was do my art. When I got to high school, my high school teacher heard this voice, and she was like, there's something in you. I got in high school, went into the Talented Akimpta program, into the... Um, and I thought I was gonna be in the art program. I sat in the art classes. That teacher came in and snatched me out of those classes and took me into the music classes. I give you this background of me because you have to understand that poetry, music, and the visual arts were the things that, were, that brought me out, that brought me from a world where I was in a poor family, in a urban city, in a struggling environment, but it's the creative arts that have brought me to today. And so I'm grateful for that. And then to think about how the traveling and the opportunities have helped me to form a worldview and to see what's happening all around the world in the places that I've been and to work with students who come from various backgrounds it's allowed me to express something in poetry and in song that can get people's attentions, that can reach them and perhaps pluck the heartstring, cause them to get up and do something about their circumstance. And the power of the creativity that we're talking about that impacts this policy is being able to find our voices in this way. I was able to take some really tough things and use my voice in a palatable way to get someone's attention, to make them listen. I could go screaming at them. I can go in anger and rage, but that doesn't get me where I need to go. It is my love. It is the love. Love is the truth about who we are. It is love or fear. I choose to live from love and to use the creative expression of poetry and music to share love. And so we'll have an opportunity to share more, but I just wanted to, to, to just give you a little bit of background on what brought me here today. Thank you.
Good morning. I have a few thank yous and a couple of warnings, and then I'll get started. First, I'd like to thank my creator, and I'd also like to thank the ancestors. I'd like to thank Dr. Braxton and Dr. Williams for inviting me. I'd like to thank you, and I'd like to thank my panelists, who are absolutely amazing. Now my warnings. Um, I will be discussing lynching, clergy sexual abuse, and gun violence. And I may also say a few explicit words. So uh, in light of that, uh, I didn't want you to be surprised. I will be sharing also from my book that I just recently published, which is called Know That You Have Been Loved. Um, it's my first collection of poetry. And um, so I want to start, or what I started with was the question that uh, Dr. Braxton aimed at me, which was how would you teach black poetry and religion? So, um, so the first idea that I came up with was actually connecting uh, James Cone's book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, with lynching poems. Um, and Cone, you know, he kind of discusses this paradox of the cross and also talks about how the symbol of the cross and the lynching tree come together in America. He also talks about the harsh reality of black life in the lynching era, which was from 1880 to 1940. And he discusses lynching spectacles. The first poem I'm going to read is about Du Bois and his witnessing of one of these spectacles. The title of the poem is called Du Bois Flashing Back on Seeing Sam Holes in the Grocery Store, April 24th, 1899. The display was immaculate and colorful, organized by size and price. The merchandise arrived only the night before, small pieces placed in jars with large labels, knuckles, liver, heart, skull, grabbed up at once by eager, awaiting souvenir hunters, all scrambling to find, squabbling to possess what was left of the charred remains of one Sam Holes in Noonan, Georgia. His lynching long complete, ashes from Holes's cut off penis and ears mixed with small remnants of his heart and liver were sliced, scooped up, and kept as mementos. The popular lynching event boasted of having over 2,000 in attendance. The high price relics of his mutilated body were quickly, quickly made their way to Atlanta and were now displayed to the left of a week's worth of flour and to the right of fresh peaches and oranges. On seeing Sam Holes in the grocery store, Du Bois stood still for a moment on Mitchell Street. As the horror of seeing a black man's burned flesh flying off the shelves amid such unrestrained white glee singed his hopes for the presentation of facts or evidence and destroyed his decorum, Du Bois slowly turned around to walk home. There will be no teaching today, no research. There will be no polite pleasantries exchanged. There will be no returning to my life as it was the day before. Instead, flashing back to that day, Du Bois would say, one could not be a calm, cool, and detached scientist while Negroes are lynched, murdered, and starved. Uh, 
I, um, I also wanted to kind of mention some other poems that might be included, uh, namely Langston Hughes' poem, Christ in Alabama, written in 1931. Um, Lucille Clifton's poem, Jasper, Texas, 1998, <clears throat> which is written about the incident of James Byrd being dragged behind and a pickup truck and beheaded. And then also Richard Wright's poem, Between the World and Me, which is actually written from the perspective of the corpse. I wanted to talk about some of the relationships I see between black religion and black poetry, especially protest poetry. I've always loved spoken word and the protest poems of the 60s and the 70s, um, The Last Poets and Nikki Giovanni, Sonia Sanchez, Amiri Barak, they're all some of my favorite poets. And what I think black poetry really does for black religion is it strips away all pretenses of respectability and addresses the problems directly. So in that sense, it can serve as a critique of black religion and its failure to speak out when it needs to, really any religion. Um, there is, of course, also the religious influence on black poetry, and we can see this in the very beginning because poets such as Phyllis Wheatley, uh, they write anti-slavery poetry, which often calls upon the moral character of white Christians to change. So this next poem is short. It's called East Side, and it's in remembrance of my cousin, Thurman Lacey, who was um, shot at point blank range in a car uh, during a drug deal gone bad. I heard about it on the news the night before, and I said, oh, how sad, only to find out that my cousin was dead. This is called East Side. Five O don't come to the East Side until a father lies dead in the street. Yeah, the cops don't come on our corner until a young mother never returns home. The boys in blue don't give a damn about our hood until our precious daughters are snatched away at the school bus stop. And when our sons have scarlet fountains flowing from their faces, the police knock on our doors at 3 a.m. and say, I'm sorry. Now I want to move on to a different type of poetry I'm actually moving on to um, theopoetics. And James Hill describes theopoetics as the ability of black religious communities to imaginatively express their faith convictions through art, song, poetry, oral witness, and other embodied practices. He notes that theopoetic practices of black religious communities were used to inaugurate alternative worlds of anti-colonial and socio-political possibility. Worlds that were often sequestered from them by the necro-political forces that surrounded them. So this first poem is actually a poem about my brother who passed away about nine years ago from a brain aneurysm. And I like to think about it in terms of a cosmic eschatology. Um, he didn't die instantly. Uh, he died a year after the aneurysm. And so I spent some of my, uh, some of my school time caregiving, serving as a caregiver. So anyway, in this poem, I'd like to think that uh, in his last moments, he felt the total interconnectedness of things 
as he was united with the divine. Alive. After I die, if you could tell them this. In the night, the walls disappeared, and in the day, the walls returned. After I die, if you could tell them what was once cracked plaster and peeling paint, worn brick and crumbling mortar, rusting steel and hope-stained glass, melted away. In its place instead were fields full of flaring suns and dancing moons exploding nebulas and expanding galaxies. Tell them the stardust I once was became one in a passionate embrace with the cosmos. And in the moment I left, while taking my last breath, I never felt more alive. And this poem, this next poem, is called Me Too, Black Church, Me Too. Now this poem is calling for ecclesiological change and healing for survivors of clergy sexual abuse. The Catholic Church is not the only body facing a crisis in clergy misuse of power. Protestant churches are also facing this same crisis. This poem is inspired by um, an experience I had while in grade school of a teacher who was also a pastor who attempted to rape me in his office. When his grip over my body loosened temporarily, I ran out of his office. I was so embarrassed and humiliated that I didn't tell anyone. He had already had sex with two of my friends. I also experienced a sexual assault my first year of college at 16. The rape was so brutal that I had a dissociative episode where I stayed in a corner of a room for a week. These are the experiences that inform this poem. And I also want to say that I, in this poem, I'm reading against the text of 2 Samuel on Tamar and Amnon. I see Amnon as what we would describe as a child predator, a rapist, a perpetrator guilty of premeditated sexual assault. And I feel that until churches can take a firm stand on clergy sexual ethics and respond to clergy abuse with swift action instead of silence, they will continue to be seen in the community as unsafe spaces and like David himself as a harbor of rapists and abusers and other men and women behaving badly. in silence and doing nothing. Perpetrators continue to destroy the lives of others. The path of pain and destruction they cause is allowed to fester and continue. What happens in silence is very different than what happens in the dark. No one's eyes are closed and the lights are all on when things happen in silence. In silence, we see everything and we say nothing. We witness what happens, yet we have no testimony or activism. Our tongues remain motionless as we watch the worst unfold. So this is the poem, Me Too. I am still a little leery when a pastor puts his hand out to shake mine, when he puts his hands on my shoulder, when his gaze turns past my face and he begins to lick his lips as he encourages me to meet him for mentoring in his office. 
Maybe I just have post-traumatic ratchet pastor disorder. I'm leery like an antelope when a lion is lying near, held captive to complicity as violators rewrite the stories of those that survive their violent crimes. Pastors who pray then pray against their flock only to be forgiven, move away and pray again. So when I sit down Sunday morning in the very last pew, I say, me too, black church, me too. Because I've seen men and women and children and clergy weighted down by either being silent or looking the other way, by being terrified to tell the truth or by denying the truth, by being manipulated or helping a manipulator, by lying about the lie that covered up the last lie that kept it all a secret. So when I go on Sunday morning and I skip Sunday school just to avoid you, I say, me too, black church, me too. Here behind the stained glass and the open red doors with Bibles in hand and hallowed corridors, don't let him hide behind that messed up theology or an apology that he spits out to cover his tracks with charisma, hooping in worship that he's only a man, a man who could not help himself, who should not be held responsible. Because he knew it was wrong. And no, it wasn't the dress or the suit that you wore that caused it. Neither God nor him being wrong stopped him from doing you great harm. So when you stand up on Sunday morning and walk out, you've got some healing to do. And I say, me too, black church, me too. Now the last section that I wanted to discuss uh, is poetry as black woman's wisdom. And this is actually a little lighter than my other topics. Um, my, my poem, my first poem here is about a conversation I had with my grandmother. And uh, I used to have five grandmothers, but now I only have one, and she's 86. And uh, so this was advice that she gave me. Sitting at the edge of the bed, as I often do when I go visit her, I started describing what happened between me and a woman I had long thought was a friend, but now was ex suspecting she was a, an enemy. After listening very attentively, she looked into my eyes, tilted her head, looked over the rim of her glasses and said, well, when someone shows you their ass, you better not be sticking around to smell it. <laughs> she sounds like a fool in the fool. I said, yes, ma'am, smiling. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. All right. Um, at this time, I just wanted to give an opportunity before we open up to the floor uh, for the uh, panelists to engage each other. Do you have questions for your colleagues on the panel or? Um... Okay, well, let's open up and have some questions. Oh, I'm sorry. If I may, um, mm -hmm. uh, just. Um, extremely grateful for this panel and for the ways that it opens our ears and our hearts to the drumbeat that calls us um, to be responsive and to be responsible for uh, the reality in which we live. And, um, and I, um, I'm grateful for the wisdom of, um, of this being called together uh, and called forth. 
One, one matter that, um, that I, I think is, is worth further discussion, and I hate to offer it <laughs> and then go. <laughs> but, but what do we do when um, our prophets mess up? What do, our, what do we do with the complexity of our prophets? And I'm so grateful for, Alanda, your, your poetry and your contributions and the ways that you name the sexual violence um, that has been a part of our history and a part of our current reality, uh, but also uh, that, that has been part of some of the others we've named <laughs> in this space. And so what do we do uh, to hold to what is prophetic and what carries us into a future of liberation um, and, and at the same time uh, to maintain our dignity and, uh, and our personhood? Um, how do we continue to press forward in uh, the wisdom of affirming, um, affirming one another in, in all of who we are, in the beauty and brilliance of she, him, they, uh, in the beauty and brilliance of, um, of queer and queer and all spaces between here and there. Um, and so this is a question that, um, that I think we have to continue to wrestle with as we deal with the poetics and the policy uh, and figure out how to unite within and around it, given the pluralism of, of black religion. Okay. So I leave the panel with that question. <laughs> Talking about dropping the mic, right? <laughs> I will just say as, as Jennifer prepares to go to her, her pastoral commitment and do some more religious poetry mm -hmm. uh, with your people, one thing that does strike me immediately is the importance in our construction of these poetic communities to emphasize just that, the ethical responsibility of communities. And as I have worked with many, uh, in particular, Christian communities, I have often said that so often if those communities would actually claim their ethical agency, which is often kind of ceded to the messianic charismatic figures in the community, but the importance of holding forth a communal ethic accountability that has in it discipline and restoration and accountability as public values and not simply the lauding of supposedly extraordinary talent and allowing the extraordinary talent to get away with everything that the community values and holds sacred. So the notion of creating poetic communities and not just extraordinary poets. I'm interested in this because when you talk about accountability in creating this community. The community that I came, I came from, the church environment I grew up in, took the Bible literally. It took everything literal. You had to follow the rule of the doctrine. And in that was included, speak not against my anointed. The pastor, the preachers, those who had been ordained as the authority and God's authority were not to be touched, were not to be spoken against. And if you saw something, you didn't say anything. I can tell you and, and bear witness to being a survivor of sexual abuse, child sexual abuse, of a preacher who had abused over 130 children in my community. 129 of them were black. And I spoke out, but as I spoke out, I was ostracized for speaking out. Mm -hmm. 
criticized and judged and your sexuality, oh, how could you dare say, oh, I mean, you're a homosexual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was a challenge for me. But then when justice came through the form of one white child of those 130 children being abused, that's when we started to get results. It took one white child to get 129 black children justice. And that's a sad testimony even to our own community who could rail and outrage and could decide that, hey, you know what? Accountability, you are abusing children and there is no reason why we should support you or be silent on that matter. We have to speak up, speak out from silence. And so our spiritual responsibility is first and foremost to make sure that our children are protected and that we speak up and we hold accountable. And you know, this literal translation is taking the Bible so literally as this is God's word that you can't touch my anointed. If your anointed is causing harm, your anointed needs to be dealt with. And I say this, when I was dealing with the situation I was dealing with and I went to the bishops of this particular denomination about it and they tried to silence me and I promised them that I would raise holy hell and that I would spread far and wide the word about the chronic abuse, systematic abuse that was going on in that denomination. That denomination is since silent so, you know, accountability. So, um, for me, this is a layered conversation because I was sexually abused as a child as well. Um, my mother, uh, God bless her, she would send me to work uh, on the weekends at this uh, strip store that was ran by the local Catholic parish. And um, you can just imagine some of the different things I saw there. But the duality to that conversation is also the fact that growing up around uh, black males that are in and out of prison, in and out of jail, in and out of juvenile, uh, when, when they get released from jail, they come home to live in the two family duplex next door to my grandmama or next door to my auntie. So, uh, the effects of that, even dealing with, with stuff like that, just, just growing up and seeing different brothers uh, approach us as young brothers in the neighborhood with predatorial vices. And you don't necessarily really have anybody to go tell that to because, I mean, who are you going to tell? So um, this isn't a new problem. It's a problem that's been treated as being treated as if it's new because finally people are starting to speak up. Uh, my sister was molested um, by family members. I knew family members that molested cousins. Uh, so I say this, women aren't wrong for potentially viewing every single man on planet Earth as a potential predator. And every single man should be treated as a potential predator until proven that you may possibly not be. And we'll never completely, holistically, 100% know because we don't know the depths of your conscience and the depths of your soul. Only God knows that. But women aren't wrong from conducting themselves in a manner that says, hey, I got to be on high alert at all times. The same way we want to be on high alert from white folks as we go, oh, white folks, we got to treat every white person like a potential predator. Well, women got to treat every, potential, every man as a potential predator. And I think that we do the conversation an immense amount of justice by bringing that into the dialogue. That's not saying that we're vilifying men. That's not saying that, uh, oh, yeah, you, that, that's nothing to be ashamed of as a man. It's just recognizing where we realistically are within society and, and owning that. 
So uh, I don't have a grand spill that leads us to a solution on this problem besides tell the truth about it. And then also with the religion, y'all got to understand the difference between a religion and a cult. So the prophet is the prophet. The prophet ain't God. The prophet makes mistakes. The Bible and the Quran are filled with prophets that made a mistake. At some point in the story, it gets to the point where the prophet messes something up. And God says, you know what? I ran with you for this, this amount of time. Now it's time for me and you to do our bid. You did what I, I asked you to do. We're at a cutoff point. But there's a difference between a cult and a religion. A cult, you can't, speak, you can't speak out against the cult leader. You can't say anything negative about the cult leader. You can't say anything negative about the practices of the cult. I don't follow a cult. I'm a member of a religion. So the religion has fallacies. The religion has things that I don't agree with. The religion was established hundreds of years ago when patriarchal vices were okay, <clears throat> when child molestation was okay, when sexism was okay, when homophobia was okay. When, if you, when the only prioritized member of the religion was the person that had a penis. So if, if we're going to talk about this stuff, let's talk about it from the, the root of the, the, the issue before we jump in and then metamorph ourselves beyond the point of, of what's really going on. Okay. Oh. Did you want to? I just want to thank uh, my panelists for their transparency and for sharing their own stories. It's very difficult for survivors of abuse to share those stories because you really have that trauma every time you discuss it. Um, I, I was hesitant to read that poem because I knew how I would react to it. Um, but I think it's important for us to begin this discussion in public. I think it's important for us to begin to express our expectations of safety. I think it's important for us to start healing and we cannot do that in silence. We have to be vocal. I also think in some ways that theologically we need to work through this too. Um, I want to say that uh, I don't. I don't mean I don't have a. I don't want to go on and on about it. But uh, I'm glad for the opportunity to talk about it. I think that when you are whole, you are able to do so much more. You are able to do be so much better in your activism, be so much better in your preaching, be so much better in your pastoral care. Um, so I wanted to use this also as an opportunity to encourage people to pursue self-care, get what you need, because as a person who is uh, wounded, um, it impacts everything you do. That wound becomes like uh, part of your embodiment, and unless you let that go, it continues to impact your work. Right before I open up to the floor, um, I want to kind of piggyback off of your last comment about, um, for, for, po for poets, I want to know, what is, what are your rituals of renewal? What renews you to go back into the fight that to go back and to confront this culture of death. What, what renews you? Mm. What are your rituals of renewal? Um, for me, because I'm, I'm very much a member of the hip hop generation and I listen to the same music that everybody else listens to. And I just feel like that's, it's, it's all good. Every, I love everything about hip hop, but there's room for growth and there's room for practicality. And I get tired of the so-called movement-related artists only being able to function in a certain functionality, only being able to talk to you about kids getting shot, only being able to talk to you about capitalism, storming the White House, or whatever. So I try to bring, for me, I feel like I was called to be a hybrid mixture of everything. You know, I'm not always mad at, 
at life, I'm not always happy. I, I, I have so many different human experiences and they deserve to, to have a platform to be talked about while also being rooted in the fact that I believe we aren't free in this land and have never been free. So I'm just telling personal truths. Some of the things that I do are meditate. Um, I meditate daily. And I also, uh, I spend time with nature. Um, I talk to God. I talk to the ancestors. You know, I, um, I make sure that I let go of things that are not mine. Uh, I identify what is not mine, and I let people keep their stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't take it on. Um, so those are some of mine. Um, for me as a, a poet, um, my poetry has always been about cleansing myself of the stuff that's trapped inside, getting it out so that I could have room as much inside for creativity as I can. Because um, when you got all that noise inside, it really gets in the way. But when you can take it out, when you can get those thoughts out, those, those issues out and take a look at them, you can actually free yourself. And I found that for me as a poet, poetry, uh, uh, I've used my poet, poetry to actually lift myself up out of some dark places. And it just happens that when I share those things, other people connect with them and it helps lift them out of dark places. So I think about what the creativity that I've been given is not mine for myself. Mm -hmm. It is for me to share, for us to share and find every part of who we are connected to it so that we can actually transform the world. These ideas and these, the imagination is powerful and it can change things in a blink of an eye. And so for me, it's, the, 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 it's going in on a, deck, a regular basis, meditation and listening. Here's the last thing, listening. I recently started this whole focus on prayer and learning how actually that prayer does not require me to say words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What can I tell God that God doesn't already know? Mm -hmm. So what do I need to do? is shut up and listen. And that has been such a powerful thing because when I have shut up and listened, God has shown me some things that have changed my life in an instant. So a part of us coming together in community is perhaps we need to come together in community where we can be still and know, listen to what divine life has to tell us and then follow that path. And poetry and creativity is a part of that process. In terms of theopoetics, um, one scholar has suggested that the only appropriate rhetorical figure when talking about God and the future God wants to create is hyperbole. To be a poet is to exercise the gift of hyperbole, to avoid what one homiletician, Henry Mitchell, called the heresy of exactness. Mm. So when you live in public spaces and your energy in the world requires hyperbolic expression to in some sense at, at least approximate what God is up to, mm. The only appropriate recovery for me in that hyperbolic state is massive doses of solitude. Mm -hmm. And to have created with those who are closest to me an appreciation that that is not detachment, that is actually an investment in wellness. Mm -hmm. I once heard a, a rhetorical poet, one of the finest preachers that I knew who was a mentor, and he would say to me after two, sometimes three, poetic excursions on a Sunday, he would say, Brad, sometimes I don't get physically right again until Thursday. Mm -hmm. And some of us who live in these 
expressions, right? These cultural moments that make room for the hyperbolic. We must also make room for the deep retreat into restoring solitude. Thank you so much. In the 21 minutes that remain, <laughs> um, there are, to my right and to my left, there are microphones. If you have questions, please bring them now. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for a robust and empowering presentation this morning. Uh, I have a question about pedagogy. I heard Dr. Braxton uh, speak explicitly about pedagogy. And then Tef Poe, I heard you offer a critique of our educational system and essentially not selling students a bill of goods. Um, I work primarily with first generation college students at a small HBCU in Jackson, Tennessee. And so I'm constantly wrestling with how do I engage my students um, and teach them critical consciousness when most of them come from trauma and are focused on survival. And so I would love to hear from the panel just what it means or what does it look like to teach critical consciousness to marginalized students when really even when they're at school, survival is often top of mind or honestly if they have been caring for their families since they were 12, when they come to me at 18, they're just really happy that there's a roof over their heads and that it's not their primary job to provide for the family immediately, but their mind is often still back home. So any insights you have in terms of pedagogical strategies and practices would be welcome. Um, that's a great question. Um, and I'll try to answer it with a little bit of personal storytelling. Um, so uh, my life has not been uh, a life of ease. I come from a very poor family. Uh, my mother was the primary breadwinner, even though we had, she had a, my, my stepfather who raised me since I was one. Um, but he came from a, a life of selling drugs, uh, being in the streets, to being a, a family man, working at factory jobs in the Midwest. The factories leave, and then he's struggling to find employment for most of my life. So my mother was really the only educated parent I had, so she pretty much sustained our family. She had a heart attack at the age of 35. Uh, she was working crazy. And, I don't, and at that time, we were children, so we didn't really understand exactly how hard she was actually working. And uh, for years, I felt that I had an artistic calling on my life, but I was raised in a Pentecostal family, a very, very strict Pentecostal family. My mother wasn't as strict about the religious vices as my father was, but still she would be in support of him because he was her husband. So uh, I left the, my, my home at like 17 years old. It created a rift between me and my parents. And uh, so a lot of people, they go, they discover the streets, and then they discover art. I discovered art, then I discovered the streets. Because the, I wanted to make art, but the only place that I could go to express myself without being judged was the streets. So uh, one thing leads to another and another and another. The, the same ritual of the dead family members, people dying, people getting killed, me feeling that I'm blessed to be alive. And then I wake up one day and I'm at Harvard University. I got tattoos all, all over my body, a couple of those of dead family members, dead friends, and I'm carrying these people in my mind to these places. And I started to have a bit of survivor's guilt, and it tore me apart. It really ripped me apart. Um, and a lot of people don't understand that it, uh, for black folks in this country, you are marginalized at the bottom because there's no access to resources and there's no access to, to being able to be your complete self. And then when you finally make it out of that bottom and you get to a, a good position, you're still marginalized because the people who you love aren't there with you and can't partake in those experiences. So I believe what has worked for me, and I constantly struggle with it, but what has worked for me, I work with a lot of kids in the, in the, from the same circumstances. 
And I always encourage them to uh, understand that it's okay to be different, and it's okay to be unique, and it's okay to lean into uh, those unique qualities about yourself. Uh, because when they come to you, this is the only space that they may have to really be adventurous with those unique qualities. Uh, outside of that, they're going to go into a world that says you have to function in a very mechanical, stiff manner. Even as a grown man that got involved in the black movement, there were people that chastised me because I was a rapper. There were folks that told me, oh, you rapping, you doing this for this. I'm like, I deal with predatory policing more than y'all will ever know about predatory policing. So uh, I think that expressing to these children and, and I'm not just speaking, because a lot of times when people speak about this, they're only speaking about the little boys a lot of times. Not realizing that, not realizing that the little girls are going through quadruple that. They're being sexualized, they're, being, uh, they're seeing images of, of one type of thing and they're being told that in order to be successful, you gotta go through this route. With boys, it's not quite that narrow. Even though it is narrow, it's not as narrow as it is for the girls. So just be in the place of deposit for these kids and, and, and being and showcasing your duality as a person as well, the way where you can care about these things, but you also, just, you're just a human, you know? Um, I think that goes a long way. In terms of um, pedagogy, there are two things that immediately come to my mind. And the first is, unfortunately in the Guild, we continue to lift as the union card subject matter competence without also insisting that we as classroom teachers have soul competence. To actually be the steward of another person's heart and mind and personhood and, and intellect for 50 minutes three times a week or 75 minutes twice a week or three hours once a week or whatever it might be, that is priestly work. So in the example that I used when Eric and I were teaching on that first day, I mean literally the cosmos broke open. It was just the energy was just pulsating because the ancestors had visited and yet the ancestors gave us wisdom that there was a moment that we gathered ourselves. And Eric will perhaps remember that once we gathered, I asked the question that I asked probably six times a seminar and maybe three or four or five dozen times in the semester. It's a question I always ask students, and it's simply this. How is, is your soul today? today? And when we, I mean, it was, it was tackle football in there sometimes with the, the kind of theoretical contestations that were going on. And when there would be critique, whether it was a critique someone was offering to another colleague or I was offering or Eric was offering, we would literally ask the question, did we handle this moment with appropriate care? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, we're always this hard driving, this competence, this, this technical mastery. Great, fine, we're scholars, we get it. But we are tending souls. So soul competence, number one, must always be a part of our pedagogical practice. The second thing I will, will share, and this came literally, and this really speaks to the embodiment issue that you raised. This comes out of the thankful place where I am now, having gone through a very serious and life-altering battle with skin cancer. I am very much on the other side and am healed, but I had some very skilled and candid physicians who walked me and my family through that battle. And I remember after a very serious surgery that finally eradicated, and it was a pretty significant wound, right? When an oncologist who's done this many times says to you, that's an intimidating wound, that was a moment. And I had to make peace with the wound. And the wound was doing some strange things one day and it made me nervous. There was this serous like fluid coming off of my wounds. And immediately when you've gone through these serious brushes with death, you begin to think, oh my God, did they not get it? What's going on? And the surgeon with amazing bedside manner 
set my soul free when he said, wounds have to weep in order to heal. In our classrooms, do we give our students and their wounds permission to weep? Not to explain it away, but to be there with enough gauze and compassion to let that wound do what it has to until healing finally comes. Well then. I, uh, <laughs> I just have a few words. Um, I work in a, I would say, I've worked in an HBCU before and right now I'm working in a community college so I can kind of imagine the type of students you have. So my first uh, suggestion would be that you need to work out of multiple intelligences. That is to say, give them as, as many different ways to learn as possible. Um, also, um, within that, I would say start where they are. So, for example, if they have research papers or whatever, let them identify the group of people that they're interested in and what type of problems they might solve for that group of people. Um, so they, that would be a high interest thing for them. Um, also, I would suggest that you send them to the library because uh, students who go to the library perform better. Uh, what else? Um, and be flexible, you know. Um, I'm, I, uh, I'm also, my, my mother was a single parent and uh, my father was a, a Vietnam vet who I didn't adjust well to civilian life. Uh, so when I went to school, I worked two jobs and I, you know, I had professors who were flexible who understood that I was working my way through school and they, they gave, instead of, I mean, there are times when you need to be rigid and times when you need to give grace and you need to know which, which is which. So that's my. Okay, we have one more question. All right. Um, I have a couple of questions, one for Dr. Braxton, one for Tef Poe, um, former student of Dr. Braxton, and I actually, my, my doctoral student, Bridie, here uh, is, is with us, so we teach together at the University of Louisville, so you all teach together. My question is, I, I'm, as your former student, I'm always uh, amazed by your, by, by your pedagogy, but what you were describing at Har Harvard is, is, is particular, right? They may have had a manifestation that didn't happen at Vanderbilt quite in that way. Um, but but I'm, I'm wondering, I teach at a public university, right, in a, in, in a religion department in a public university, oftentimes with first generation kids and so on and so forth, who need that kind of pedagogical experience, I think. But I'm wondering how you imagine that in that context, because you were in a divinity school after all, albeit Harvard, right? Yes. You were in a divinity school, and so I'm wondering if there's, if, how you would imagine that pedagogical practice within a public university. And then with Tef Po, you, 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 I was fascinated when you said, I feel called to be a kind of hybrid of all of these things as a, as a, as a sense of calling. Um, whether that's artist and activist, whether that's hip hop um, and you know, conscious hip hop and ratchet, whether that's Christian and Muslim, as I'm hearing, right? And so how have you been able to, to show up in space bringing your whole hybrid self Right, and, and what is that, that meant for you? Particularly, have you been able to show up in religious community mm -hmm. with that whole hybrid self? And if so, how has that been received and what do you think they, they may have gained, gained from that? Thank you for that wonderful uh, opportunity to think about how you turn the diamond in various pedagogical settings. I think my first response is in any setting, even in a public university setting, you have an opportunity to invite your students into what, let's say, Ellison and others might call right, the deeper or the lower frequencies. So there's a way to frame this with kind of humanistic language that is still getting at what religious communities are getting at when they're much more explicit, is that element of spirit, that element that often is not tangible, 
that gives a certain pulse and drive to life. So that I have literally done the same thing. Uh, again, it was a, a different, it was a private university, but I, I taught at Georgetown in an arts and science experience. And we literally did the same thing every morning to the place where the students said, even if the transcendental claims that may be underneath some of what you're singing don't meet me, what you do is changing the energy and it's tapping something lower in me that needs to be tapped. So I think there's a humanistic way that that can be framed that doesn't always have the theological freight that sometimes can make things complicated politically in our settings, but still get to the core. There is more to this than simply meets the eye. And the great moral and religious traditions have always tried to burrow down to that lower frequency. Man, I can listen to Dr. Braxton talk all day, man. <laughs> you got the truth, man. Um, so I think a lot of the way I approach my work actually comes from uh, living in poverty, um, seeing so many of my friends who would have benefited from developing a little bit more nuance to their lifestyle uh, and, and the lack of that development and what it meant for them. It meant going to prison. It meant dying prematurely. It meant not experiencing a whole, like a healthy relationship with their partner. Uh, it meant so many different caveated things that uh, the greatest teacher that I've experienced in my life, even though I'm young, is, is experience. And uh, the greatest lesson that I learned coming out of the Ferguson uprising, uh, you hear a lot of folk talk about Ferguson, but what was actually going on on the ground and versus the academic intellectual analysis, two different, totally different things. So when you're on a corner with 250 people and there's an entire police force with, with MRAPs and M16s aimed at you, it's very easy for your ego to go through the roof when you're the person that moved those 250 people off that corner. Mm -hmm. So controlling uh, my ego has, has been mm -hmm. um, the greatest gift God ever gave me. And, and I still struggle with that because I go places and people go, oh, Tef, you're the anomaly. And I'm like, let's chill because I got to go use the bathroom like you do. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, I grew up Christian. And I, I recently converted to Islam, even though, um, even for me, but still even within that, there's a lot of nuance. Um, part of the motivation for me to start studying the Islamic text more was I wasn't seeing enough nuance in the Christian uh, practices, of, at least of the churches and the, and the communities that I was a member of. And the reason I say that is uh, I didn't feel prideful when I saw Barack Obama sing Amazing Grace after a black church got shot up. I felt defeated. I didn't feel great about that. So like a lot of people who celebrated that as like, oh my God, we're still so merciful, we're still so compassionate. At that point, I wanted a real verbatim, <laughs> what are we gonna do? You know, like they're killing our elders in a place of worship. And what did it for me was, I, I said I gotta do something different is when I realized that a lot of these white supremacists were also so-called Christians. So you mean to tell me the black folk that they shot up in the church and the person that shot them in the church are gonna go to the same place of paradise? I just couldn't negotiate that. So I said, I gotta do something different. Even though I still very much believe in the teachings of Christ as a prophet and even as a Messiah in some instances, for me in my personal life, I had to deposit that energy through something different. And it's sort of how Vincent was saying uh, the prayer the silence and the tranquility of just saying, you know, I don't have all the answers. I'm just going to put myself out here as a tool and allow myself to be used. So um, I'm going to close it because I know I talk a lot. But for me, just, just understanding that nuance of you as a human and, and that, you know, nothing flows one way. And unfortunately, we have these grand historical examples of folks that were very, 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 very nuanced individuals, but publicly they weren't allowed to be that. 
like somebody like Michael Jackson, when you really look into his real life, he was speaking up for black artists his whole life. But do we really even know that about Michael Jackson publicly, or do we just equate him to the guy that got up here, danced, did a couple backflips, and that was that? Somebody like Martin Luther King, who was a gun owner, who when a reporter came to his house, the reporter sat on a love seat, sat on a loaded 12 gauge, <laughs> right? Uh, somebody like, um, I could go on and on. There's just so many different examples of these nuanced black individuals that, that we don't fully explore that. And what I, I made a commitment to myself as a black man is that I'm not gonna let this world rob me of that nuance. I'm not gonna let y'all tell me that I gotta be a gangster, I gotta be a rapper, I gotta be a revolutionary, I can't be this, I can't be that. I'm all that, unfortunately, slash fortunately. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, we have had an amazing time today. I think we should give our panelists a hand.